your Bibles, please, to Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. Lord willing, I'll finish Sunday morning sermon tonight. And so, uh, looking forward to that. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. So we're going to take a real brief review and then hit the ground running as we finish up this passage about the house of prayer for all people. The house of prayer for all people. And so we began it Sunday morning and had... Lord's leading will finish it up then tonight. Isaiah chapter 56 and beginning in verse number 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and that take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of, in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. All ye beasts of the field, come to devour. Yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one to his own gain, from his own, from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more. Abundant. Father, help us tonight. Lord, even as I read it again, I'm so much in there to challenge us and help us. But Lord, help me be as brief as you would have me be, that our minds and hearts and spirits would be touched with just the, just what we need. Lord, each of us have a different need tonight. Each of us are in a different place in our life. Each has different circumstances going on around us. But Lord, your, your word is alive and it's quick and it's powerful and Holy Spirit, you can take it and apply it. So Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight. Catch what we need. Be attentive to what we need. Be willing to accept and surrender to what we need. So Lord, help us tonight as we look at some things you're trying to teach that are for all people. Not just preachers, not just the Sunday school teachers, but for all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In this passage, as God is speaking to the children of Israel, we're reminded... As he speaks there, particularly in verse number 7, it says to be called a house of prayer for all people. Again, we need to remember that God has a desire for all people. God doesn't want just some people to grow and other people to, to fall by the wayside. God doesn't have a desire for some folks to be on fire and other folks to be cold. God has some things just for all people. Aren't you glad it's for all people? We've got different roles, we have different gifts and different things, but God has some certain things we'll see Continuing tonight about what it is that is for all people. So God desires, first of all, by way of review, that all people be saved. That all people be saved. We understand that. So as we look at God's plan for the future of Israel, as well as God's desire for His people here in 2020, the house of God for all people. So we see as God's dealing with for all people, his house of prayer for all people, we found, first of all, that salvation is near for all people. Salvation is near for all people. It's close. I'm glad salvation isn't something that you have to spend six months to a year studying. I'm glad salvation isn't something you have to study up and pass a test. I'm glad salvation is near for all. Jesus often taught that as he talked to different people. He said the kingdom of God is near unto you. He said it's close. It is close and readily available for us. And so we know that salvation is near for all people. We saw that. We saw also in this passage, God reminds us that there's signs 
signs of salvation for all people. There are signs of salvation for all people. When people get saved, their lives change. When people get saved, there's a new desire, a new hunger to go forward. And we see that as God spoke to them about keeping the Sabbath. Those that come to Him, they should keep the Sabbath. Not to get saved, but because they are saved, they ought to keep the Sabbath. There ought to be something new in their life, and they ought to keep their hand from evil. So we saw for all people, I wish everybody could get that. Every, I wish every child of God could understand that. That it's for all people. Salvation is near, but also the signs of salvation. Your signs and my signs, the changes in our life, it ought to be evident for all God's people. Because we're all changed. And we find also, number three, we saw the security of the sanctified in verses three through five. The security of the sanctified, those that are saved. Some wonderful truths we saw about that. Let's, let's just read that part. Verse number three. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself, because we're talking about being secure. We're talking about having that confidence. We're talking about going home, going to bed, and on good days and bad days, just knowing we're His child, knowing that God still loves us, knowing that we've got a place, that's security. And He's speaking there in verse 3, Never, Neither let the son of the stranger, in other words, those who were not Jews, those that were not born children of Israel, but that have been brought into the tribes, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, he said, don't let the man who just got saved say this. Don't let the stranger say this. The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. He said, don't let the stranger say God's thrown me out. Don't let the stranger say I'm afraid God's going to disown me. Don't let the stranger say I'm afraid God doesn't care about me. He says, don't say that. God wants him to have that security. Neither let the eunuch say, we didn't spend a lot of time, but the eunuch are those that God said could not be part of the priestly kingdom. The eunuchs weren't really allowed into the children of Israel per se. Those that could not have children, those that had either made themselves eunuchs or because of they were, were eunuchs, they were somewhat of an outcast. And he said, neither let the eunuchs say, behold, I am a dry tree. He says, don't, don't let the, even the eunuchs say that they're not loved. Don't let the eunuchs say they're unfruitful. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them. I will give in mine house and within my walls a place. We talked about he gives us a place. Well, we're insecure because God says he will not cast us out. We can be secure because God says he will give a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. Yes, we're sons and daughters, but there's a special name. That relationship we can have with God is even closer than sons and daughters. A unique name, a unique relationship, an everlasting name. Boy, what a blessed thing to be given a place and a name. We can have confidence as the children of God, we have the place and name. So we find the security of the sanctified. Now, let's go on and we'll pick up verse number six with a new area. So here we go. We find the service of sons for all people. The service of sons as sons and daughters of God, as those that have a name better than just son, better than just daughter, that special name, God gives some special service for us. Verse number 6. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him, to love the Lord, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of his covenant. Even them will I bring into my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So we find the service. These strangers that got saved, these savers that, sa strangers that joined themselves to the Lord, now they have a place and a reason for service. By the way, I'm glad we can serve. I'm glad God allows old sinners saved by grace to serve Him. I think it's there in your notes in Galatians 4. It reminds us that we are sons by adoption. It says to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the re adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So we have the adoption of sons. And because we are adopted son, we have the Spirit of the, the begotten Son. What a blessed thing to be the Son of God and have the Spirit of God inside of us. But then it goes on and says, we're... No more a servant, but a son. And by sons, we get to serve. 
How many know sons are supposed to serve? Boy, it talks about that all through the Bible. Son, go work in my field. Son, do this. Sons are supposed to serve. So we're not a servant serving just, just as a servant, just as a slave, but we're a son who gets to serve. And so here he says that we've got that adoption of sons and we get to serve. So let's look back at our text in verse number 6 and let's see what God tells us. We've got this new name, but we get to serve. Notice the service that they have. We find, first of all, their desire. Their desire. These folks that have joined themselves to God, that join themselves to the Lord, those folks that are now been adopted into uh, the children of Israel, we find the desire. Verse number 6. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord. We find there that this idea, their desire is love and service. And I think it's there in your notes. Love and service go together. It's not a coincidence God has brought both is in there, but love and service goes together. Again, it says that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord. Love and service. Joined. They go together. If there's something we really love or somebody we really love, we will serve. I think you can serve without loving. We know that. But you can't love without serving. If it's real love, there's going to be that desire to serve. There's going to be that real love to say, I want to do something for them. Yeah, how many know you can serve without loving? Tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, you go to the workplace and you may not love that boss, but you know how to serve him. But there's a whole different aspect. So God in his word tells us there's a... They go together, loving and service. So if we're going to love God, we will serve. First of all, in our that's true in our relationship to God. In our relationship to God. Here in the case, it says they came to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord. But that's one of the requirements is we love and serve. It goes together. I believe it's in your notes in Deuteronomy 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? He says, what does God require? He says, children of Israel, this is required. What is it? But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Our relationship with God. We're to love him and serve him. If we love him, we will serve him. There's that unique equation. That by love we serve Him. It works in our relationship with God. It works in our relationship with, ready, the church. With the church. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Now before we finish that, God reminds us we have liberty. I do not have to do things to keep myself saved. I don't have to come to church to keep myself saved. That's until my version of the Bible comes out later in the fall. Then we got that. No. We don't have to come to church to be saved. We don't have to tithe to be saved. We, don't, we have liberty. We have freedom. There's lots of liberty we have in Christ. And it says, so you've got liberty. He said, but don't use it for an occasion to the flesh. Don't use that liberty to do whatever you want. Don't use that liberty to do whatever your flesh wants. Don't use that liberty to make your own choices. He goes on, but, in other words, instead of using our liberty for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By what class? By love serve one another. So in this liberty I have, I'm supposed to use this liberty to love and to serve one another. And he's talking to the folks there in the church. We're to, by love, serve one another. That's one of the functions we're supposed to be doing inside the church. So in Sunday school, as a Sunday school teacher, you're loving and serving one another. Working in the nursery, you're loving and serving one another. When you're cleaning, it's by love and serving one another. When you're working in the yard, it's by love serving one another and serving those in the church. Whether it be in our prayer time, loving and service. You're doing care calling, it's loving and serving. It, it's so vital that we bring those two together. The problem is we serve without loving and we get disgruntled. We serve without loving and we get upset. We serve without loving and we feel abused and cheated and taken advantage of. But we cannot tear that apart. Here in these, Jew, these strangers that came, he said they came to serve and to love. It was a choice for them. So in all sorts of jobs, in all jobs, it's with love. So their desire was to love and serve. The two go together with our God. 
and with the church and with our families. And with our families. Love and service. Galatians 5.13. We saw that by love serve one another. Ephesians 5.8. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord, the church. So the idea is men were supposed to love our wives and then cherish them, nurture them, serve them. Our, and when we, as, we, as we're married and have our families, we're to serve. Dads, we're to love and serve our family. That's our job, not the other way around. Too many times we get the idea that, oh, well, I'm, I'm Papa. I'm the Father. I'm the Dad. You serve me. You've missed it. Yes, we say, well, I'm supposed to be head of the family. That's right. And as head of the family, you're supposed to serve the family. Just like the king was there to serve his people. Just like the president of the United States is supposed to serve the people. Just like the congressmen are supposed to serve the people. Just as the pastor is supposed to serve the people. Just as each of us are supposed to serve one another. In our families, it's love and service. So let's serve. Moms, you're to serve love and serve your family. Kids, you're to love and serve your family. Love and service are are united together. So their desire, their desire was to love and serve. Boy, how's your desire coming? He said the eunuchs and the strangers that have chosen to come in, they've joined themselves to the Lord to serve and to love. To serve and to love. Notice their decisions. That was their desire. Notice very quickly their decisions. Number one was to serve him. Their purpose was was to serve him. That's what their purpose was. Verse number 6. Also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord. So those non-Jews that got saved. Those non-Jews that converted. To serve him. That was their purpose. To serve him. What's their purpose? That will be to serve him. But not just their purpose, but their position. If you've drifted off, you've got to come back because this next one keys for everything else. Notice the position. To serve Him and to love the name of the Lord our God, to be His servants. So we find their position is to be their, His servant. The world does not look at the position of servant as a very high position. The world looks down on people that take the position of servant or position themselves as servants. But the Bible tells us, Christ tells us, that's a high position to be a servant. Yet Christ shows us a better way. Philippians 2, 6, talking about Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Jesus said in Mark 10, 44, And whosoever of, you, whosoever of you will be the chiefest, whoever's going to be the boss, whoever's going to be the best, whoever's going to be the top, shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Christ says, No, the chiefest is servant of all. He said, that even as, he said, look at me as an example to come and to minister and to serve. It's amazing how we get that all twisted up. Again, parents or husbands can get to the place, well, I'm, I'm, the, well, I'm supposed to be head of the family. Yeah, that means you're supposed to be servant of all. Our politicians often get that reversed. The people are supposed to serve. No, they're supposed to serve. It can happen with the pastor. They get the idea, well, the people are supposed to serve the pastor. No, the pastor is supposed to serve the people. By the way, we're supposed to serve one another. Amen? Amen. But especially if as pastor is the position. So we need to serve. But here's the key. Their purpose was to serve him. For all people. Their position was to be a servant. Here's the key. When we accept our position, it's much easier to fulfill our purpose. When we accept our position, our purpose becomes clear and fulfilling. 
In other words, when I realize my position before God is to serve Him, if that's my position, that's my job, that's my position, I'm a servant to God, then my purpose of serving God doesn't become a drudgery. My purpose for serving God doesn't become a place where I get upset and where I get angry because that is my position. My position of servant then, fulfilled. it makes me fulfilled. It fulfills my life because I'm fulfilling my position and fulfilling my purpose. But again, the problem comes when I don't accept my position as servant or I forget my position as servant. Then when I, my purpose becomes difficult, when my purpose becomes a little dr- drudgerous, then I'll get bitter, I'll get angry, and I'll get indifferent, and I'll fall away. So we have to maintain that. So you and I have to remember our perp- our position is a servant of His. Our position as servant in a home. Our position of serving one another. That is my position. Then my purpose is clear. What I'm supposed to be doing is clear. And it fulfills me. In fact, in Luke 17, or Luke 17, 7, Jesus giving an explanation tells us and reminds us that when we know our... By the way... We need to accept joyfully our position. That's what Jesus did. He says, I came to minister, not to be ministered unto. So we accept that position. But in Luke 7, verse, or 17, verse number 7, Jesus said, But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, so there's a servant out there, he's plowing and feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field. So the servant comes in from the field. He said, Who, who, who of you has that servant? Will say, Go sit down to eat. But rather, but say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird myself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did that what was commanded him? I throw not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all things which are commanded you say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done all that was our duty to do. So he said that servant is going to expect to do what he's told. And just said, this is my job. This is my duty. He won't be upset. He won't be angry. He won't say, how come I have to feed him supper? Because that's my job to serve him. How come I have to wait on him? Because that's my job as servant. So when we accept our position, then our purpose becomes clear. And our purpose is fulfilling. Amen. See, see, ladies... See, when a lady loses track of the fact that she's supposed to submit to her husband and serve her family, then she gets bitter when it doesn't work out that way. Daddies, when we forget that we're supposed to be serving our family, and when all of a sudden I have to miss a football game, or I have to miss a place, a little golf game, or I have to sacrifice some toy or some financial responsibility to care for my family, if I've forgotten my position as servant, I'll get bitter. I'll get angry. I'll get resentful. We've got to remember our position. And what position is that? Same as Christ. Servant. 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 So we find their purpose. Here are these folks coming in. For all people. The sons of the servant. The, the strangers. The ones who just came in. Not even the born Jews. But the ones that joined in. said, boy, their, their, their purpose was to serve. Their position was servant. Very quickly, their passion was to love him. To love him. Verse number six. To serve him and to love the name of the Lord. That was their purpose. Again, love is a choice. They came in to serve. They came in to be a servant. And they came in to love. It doesn't say they loved and so they came in. No. They came in to love. That's why the purpose of marriage ought to be to love. See, I'm, we're joining up husband and wife to love one another. That was the purpose of it. To love. Their passion. Well, how are we doing? For all people. My house of prayer for all people. All people. The service of the sons. We find their passion and we find their practice. Their practice. And that's to obey Him. Verse number 6. To be His servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant. In other words, just obey Love, service, and obedience. So what's my relationship with Christ? Love, service, and obedience. That's what they have there. He said, I'm coming in to be a servant, and to serve, and to love, and obey. 
It's all rolled into one. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It, it all works. Love, service, and obedience. Boy, you just want to nail down the day-to-day -day Christian living. There it is. Love, service, and obedience. Love, serve, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And obey Him. And serve Him. That was required by God. And that fearing of God and reverential loving fear. Well, love, service, and obedience. The service of sons. Very quickly, notice the sanctuary of the saints for all people. The sanctuary of the saints for all people. And again, this is not just for the Wednesday night crowd. This is for all the people. He said, my house will be a house of prayer for all people. In fact, if, especially for these strangers. Very quickly, notice the sanctuary or the house of prayer, if you will, of the saints for all people. Verse number 7. Even them. Even who? The sons of the strangers. Those that just join themselves to us. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Notice, first of all, the service of the saints for all people. There's joy in the house of prayer. Joy in the house of prayer. Notice what it says, verse 7, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Notice it did not say... There was going to be prayer in the house of joy. Jesus didn't call it his house of joy. His house of what class? Prayer. There's a real danger in Christianity today to focus all on the joy. All, matter of fact, they don't, even have, they don't even have the right joy nailed down. It's all happiness. It's all fleshly satisfaction. They don't, even, they don't even talk about the real joy in the Lord. But he said there'd be joy in my house of prayer. Not a prayer in the house of joy. We'll see it here and I'll show you a verse in a second. Joy does not usually, it should, but it does not usually bring fervent prayer. In your life and my life, joy... Oh boy, how's your day? Doing great. How's your prayer life? How much? How long did you pray today? Well, I think I forgot. But let the reverse happen. Sorrow. Listen, I'll show you the verse in a second. Sorrow brings prayer, which brings joy. Notice, I, think, I can't remember if I put it in your notes or not. Psalm 42, verse number 3. Is that in there? Oh, look at it. My tears have been my meat. Day and night. In other words, he said, that's all I've had. It's just been with me all the time, my tears. While they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. So there's his prayer. He said, I'm pouring out my soul. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with him to the house of God, which is the house of prayer, with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. So from his tears he remembered God and he went to the house of prayer, if you will, the house of God and with a voice of joy and praise. There's joy in the house of prayer. Boy, so when our prayer is right, when our prayer is right, then we'll find the joy. Again, we've got too much joy, if you will, in the world. We forget to pray. But in the house of prayer, he said, I'll give you joy in that house. See, preacher, my joy is a little bit low. All right, why don't you have some more prayer? It's that prayer that brings the joy, not the, the joy that brings the prayer. It should. As God gives us blessings, as God stirs us with joy, that ought to bring prayer, but that usually does not. It's when we forget Him, when we've got the joy. So we find joy in the house of prayer, not prayer in the house of joy, but joy in the house of prayer. So we've got that. Then secondly, we see worship in the house of prayer. Worship in the house of prayer. Notice verse number 7. Even them will I bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. I like the fact that he said, I'll make them joyful. They don't have to stir it up themselves. They don't have to make it up themselves. They don't have to find it anywhere else. He says, man, I'll bring them into my house of prayer and I'll make them joyful. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So we have that worship. That worship. Their sacrifices is acceptable. Their burnt offerings is acceptable. There's worship in the house of what class? 
prayer. Wow. Psalm 5, 7. But as for me, I will come into the house, come into thy house, talking about God's house, the house of prayer, in the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear, and I will worship toward thy holy temple. If we can know and experience and remember his mercy, worship comes. That's what it says. He said, I will come into the house in the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Boy, if we can just remember his mercy, worship will come. So we've got the sanctuary of the saints for all people. He said, my house of prayer for all people. For the Jews and for the non-Jews that get converted. Boy, it's for every child of God, every Christian. It's all of us should be in that sanctuary, the house of prayer. Very quickly, souls to be sought by all people. Souls to be sought by all people. Soul winning, verse number 8. The Lord God which gathered the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him, beside those that are gathered unto him. So we have the strangers that came in, the eunuchs that came in, and then God says, I'm gathering all the outcasts of Israel, the Jews that were outcasts, and anybody else out there outcasts, yet will I gather others to him. God gathers. God gathers souls. God gathers people. How does God gather? By us. Hello. By us. John, John 10, 16. Jesus said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Let me help you with something. He's not talking about E.T. I've had folks say, Well, see, that proves extraterrestrials, and God's talking about people on another planet. No, he's talking about those that weren't Jews. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Romans ten fourteen. How shall they call on him whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe on whom have they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? First Corinthians nine sixteen. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. There are souls to be sought, the people, by all people. He God says, I'm bringing them in. He says, but boy, I said, there's others to bring in. He said, I want to bring more in. And we're the ones that bring them in. Amen. Souls to be sought by all people. By my house of prayer for all people. All people. And we saw last, we saw Sunday, that was one of the jobs of the Jews, to go out in the world and bring them to the one true God. That they're, they're, they'd be the light. They're to be the salt. They would go out and bring them in, even the, from, from Ruth and Rahab, and even the, pros, even the, the priests in, the, in Jesus' time went out to proselyze to bring people to the one true God. Very quickly, notice for all people, we find the snares to be shunned by all people will be done. The snares to be shunned by all people. With all this blessing God has, with all this excitement, He's going to deliver them from the, from the bondage. He's going to deliver them from the Babylonian captivity. He brings in the eunuchs. He brings in the strangers. He's going to bless them. He's going to give them names that with eternal names. He's going to give them names better than sons and daughters. He's going to accept their worship. Boy, what a blessing. But then He says, here's a warning. Verse number 9. All ye beasts of the field come to devour. Yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchman. So he said, there's beasts coming in. There's an enemy out there that's going to devour. And his watchman. The watchmen are supposed to be watching for the enemy. The watchmen are supposed to be watching these beasts, if you will, of the field. These animals that are going to come. These, non these beasts that are going to come devour. These beasts that are going to come destroy. There's watchmen. They're supposed to be watching for that. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one to his gain from his quarter. First of all, we find in that passage some snares. He says, watch out, be on guard. Silent sentinels. Silent sentinels. In other words, dogs, guard dogs that can't bark. Watchmen are blind, they are ignorant, they are dumb dogs, they cannot bark. Wouldn't be much of a guard dog that wouldn't bark. That could not bark. 
See, these are the sentinels. They're the watchmen. They're supposed to cry out, Oh, look, this! Well, here's the enemy that's coming. Here's the, the beasts that are coming. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. They're the watchmen. But God says they're quiet. They cannot bark. They're blind. They're ignorant and lazy. That's what he says. These sentinels, which you and I are supposed to be, which the pastors and preachers are supposed to be, they're blind, ignorant, and lazy. Notice what it says. His watchmen are blind. Can't say it. Boy, a lot of, a lot of, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I have to guard myself. But we have to be careful. There's a lot of watchmen out there that are blind. They can't see it. They just can't see the truth. They can't see the dangers. They can't see the attacks. They're all ignorant. It means they just don't know. They just don't know the dangers. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping. They're asleep. Lying down. Loving to slumber. Just lazy. Boy, let's, let's make sure we as watchmen, either as preachers or as pastors or as parents, boy, that we're not silent sentinels. As the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking who may devour, as we, as, as God's people are, as the Bible talks about being the speckled birds round about, but the animal, the birds round about, the beasts of the field that come to devour, boy, we need to not be blind, ignorant, or lazy. Amen? We ought to be able to proclaim and watch and give the call to watch. Oh, that God would give us some dogs that can bark. Oh, that we would be people that would heed the barking. Instead of telling the dog, shut up. It's an amazing thing. We have dogs that, if they bark too much, we don't pay much attention. But boy, when they're out there trying to, we say, shut up. Shut up. We ought to say, what are, you, are you trying to tell me something? Silent sentinels. Dogs that cannot bark. Self-centered shepherds. Another snare to his people to watch out. Self-centered shepherds. Verse 11. They are greedy dogs that can never have enough. Can't get enough. Can't get enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They look to their own way. Everyone for his gain from his quarter. Well, let's be careful. I have to be careful. Pray for me. Pray for other shepherds. You as parents as shepherds. Don't be greedy. Don't be self-centered. Notice what it says. Here's the shepherd. The enemy is out there. The danger is coming. The, the, the beasts are coming. But they are shepherds that cannot understand. They look to their own way. They want their own way. Not God's way. Not the right way. Everyone for his own gain. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Boy, that's a problem with marriages today. It's husbands and wives. What's in it for me? As parents, what's in it for me? When you got married, when you start having kids, you've then changed that, go back to that position we're supposed to have of servants. But here it is. Here's the shepherd. It said, what's in it for me? Their own gain. And from their own quarter. Boy, he gives a warning. Snares me by all people. In this house of prayer for all people, it needs to be shunned. Self-centered shepherds. Boy, we all know parents like that. We all know people like that. We've all known pastors like that. Very self-centered. But also seductive speeches. Seductive speeches. Verse number 12. Well, if we can't see, if, I don't watch a lot of other preachers, but I've heard some, and I hear about them. But here they are. Here's these shepherds, supposed to be watching out. Come ye, they say, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. Oh, there's a whole sermon in that. So it's seductive. He says, come on. Boy, we're going to have wine, and we'll have strong drink. And we will fill ourselves with strong drinks. If we're just going to satisfy the flesh, it's all right. You don't have to live. Don't deny yourself. Don't deny yourself some pleasures of the flesh just because God says it's sin. Don't deny yourself. That. Let's fill ourselves. But notice what it says. And tomorrow shall be as this day. And much, much more abundant. Just more and more Self-fulfilling. More and more flesh gratification. More and more. And that's what the shepherd is saying. God says, don't watch out for that. So we have snares to be shunned. The silent sentinels. And sometimes the preachers ought to bark. Amen? 
Dad, you ought to be barking sometimes. Say, Whoa, watch out for that. Oh, that's no good. That's not, that's not the direction. That's the danger. Don't go there. Here comes somebody. There ought to be some barking going on. Shepherds ought not to be self-centered. And certainly not to be seducing with their speech the wrong way. God says the house of prayer, verse 8, for all people. Verse 7, rather. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for just mature Baptists. No. For just American Caucasians. No. For all people. All 